And I wanted to know, what does your day-to-day -day look like in pediatric residency? All programs are gonna be different. When you're looking into pediatric residency, it's important to think what you want out of a program. What was the most difficult thing that you found when you were transitioning from pre-doc, you know, dental school to pediatric residency? Well, there were two. Um, we're the ones listening in with the pretracheal stethoscope. So we are in charge of making sure that that child is breathing. So it's very no intense. <laughs> it's nerve wracking. No pressure. Not at all. Is he breathing? Yes. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to see you guys. I know it's a Sunday and it's late. So I'm just waiting for Jess here. Hi, Jess. Hey, how's it going, Josie? <laughs> so happy to have you here. I'm so excited for this. We've kind of, you know, crossed paths with each other throughout our time at Marquette. And I've seen you just become this awesome clinician and doctor. And it's honestly really exciting. I am lisping a little bit, guys. I have a new <laughs> attachment here on my Invisalign, so <laughs> the struggles. <laughs> the struggle is real. I remember going through Invisalign and experiencing that same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was the worst. You'll get through it, girl. Oh, thank you. It is honestly the worst. Excited that you guys are all here. Uh, Jess and I realize it's Super Bowl weekend. <laughs> Yes. I didn't realize it till like earlier today. I was like, oh, wait. This is so important, you guys. Um, if you do know me, uh, you know me as Josie Dental. And I've been documenting my journey throughout, you know, from the minute that I got interviews to just actually being in dental school. And so now we're doing uh, Decode Dental. And this is the first uh, series, interview series that we're doing, and it's the dental bio series. I wanted to bring on extraordinary people here in our dental field that can kind of help us feel a little less lonely because sometimes it just feels like we're kind of in it on our own, even though we have a support network or whatever it is. It's just sometimes really, really nice to hear how other people have gotten to where they are. And sometimes it's a linear path and sometimes not so much. So uh, Jess and I share a mentor, right, Jess? We do. We do. Dr. Cheska Avery. She has been absolutely phenomenal. And actually, it looks like uh, Dr. Estella Ireland is here as well. And she was one of uh, Dr. Avery's mentees as well. So um, yeah. The way that it's going to work is we're going to go ahead and ask Dr. Vargas a bunch of questions because she has a lot to tell us. And then you guys can have some time with her at the end and ask her your questions. Before we start, I want to go ahead and have you introduce yourself, Dr. Vargas, because I know you, but I want other people to know you too. Like, where are you from? What's your family like? What is their educational background? Things like that. Of course. Well, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much, Josie, for inviting me to uh, speak to everyone tonight. I'm so excited. I was excited when you told me, and I'm uh, really eager to share my journey. Uh, hopefully, it can help somebody tonight and in the future. And thank you so much for the kind words. It's been amazing to see you grow as well as a dental professional and um, to see how big your platform has become. It's absolutely amazing and you're killing it in dental school. So props to you, girl. Um, but just a little bit about me. So my name is Jessica Vargas. I uh, was born in California, actually. And then I moved to Illinois when I was about seven or eight years old and I'm 27 now. So I am technically from the Southwest suburbs of Chicago. That's home to me, Plainfield, um, Illinois. It's right next to Naperville. Um, so a lot of you probably know Naperville, but not so much Plainfield. Um, but anyway, so I grew up there and I went to undergrad at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. And then after that, I went on to dental school um, at Marquette University School of Dentistry. I fell in love with pediatrics along the way, and now I am at UCLA, 
Go Bruins, uh, for my pediatric dental residency. What made you choose dentistry? This is a common question. We always have to ask how people got to, you know, this field. So I'm going to give you like a mini spiel of what I said during my interviews for dental school, because that's really how I got into dentistry. Um, so I wasn't actually inspired by an old dentist of mine. Um, I met her when I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, and I was going in for Invisalign. And um, she just made me feel really comfortable. I really enjoyed all of my visits with her. And she would always tell me, you know, you remind me a lot of myself. You should go into dentistry. You should go into dentistry. But I never really thought much of it. And um, it actually wasn't until the week before I graduated high school, because I initially had um, gotten accepted into U of I as a political science pre-law major. So I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and um, I was so, you know, headstrong on that, that law was for me, that I was going to do it. And then a week before high school graduation, I kind of had this epiphany, like, wait, I don't want to do law. Like, that's not what I'm passionate about. I love science. I love math. I love working with my hands. I want something um, that I know is always going to be in high demand, which is something in the health field. So that last week was very busy for me. I went ahead and I shadowed a pharmacist at Walgreens. It was cool, but it wasn't for me. <laughs> I shadowed my optometrist and that was great too, but it just wasn't for me. Um, I shadowed my family doctor. Again, great career, just wasn't for me. And then finally, I just sat back and I was like, wait, I have been constantly being told that I should go into dentistry. Why haven't I even considered that? So I went in um, to go get my uh, trays um, from my dentist and I just asked her if she was happy. And she thought that was kind of a weird <laughs> question to ask. Um, and uh, she asked me, you know, of course, well, why do you ask? And I said, you know, I think I'm considering dentistry. And she was super ecstatic about it, of course. And, um, the Monday after I graduated from high school, I went into shadow. So I showed up in my bubblegum pink scrubs <laughs> and I was super excited and I ended up staying the whole day. And the thing is my dentist expected me to be there for maybe what, two, three hours at most. But, um, you know, I had no idea what I was doing or, you know, what was going on with these appointments, but they made me put on gloves and I'm handing random <laughs> instruments over and the assistant's handing it to me so I can hand it to the dentist. And it was overwhelming and everything, but the difference between me shadowing there at a dental office and me shadowing at these other, you know, health um, offices was that I was very eager to know why I was doing what I was doing. And I was very intrigued and the day just flew by. I even took a lunch with the crew <laughs> and then I helped clean up at the end. And then thankfully she offered me the opportunity to work full time as a dental assistant. Um, so awesome. while I was on break from undergrad for uh, summer vacation, winter break, Thanksgiving break, whatever break, I went home and I worked full time. I needed the money and it was a great experience for me as well. So that is how I fell in love with dentistry. That is awesome. And you have to appreciate the hustle, you know? <laughs> yeah, I you work. You have to appreciate the hustle. One more thing, because uh, I didn't answer it. You asked me for my family background. Yeah. Um, so my mom is from Jamaica. She was born in Jamaica. And my dad is from Mexico, and he was born in Mexico. So I'm Jamaican and Mexican, first generation born here in the States and also first generation college student. Um, so the pathway to dentistry wasn't necessarily the easiest for me. Um, I don't have a long legacy of dentists or um, let alone college grads in my family, but where, there, where there's a will, there's a way. And that's what makes you so special because, you know, I think people underestimate how much it really does take a village and how much support it does take to reach these and just even picturing yeah. ourselves in a spaces like this. Whereas before, you know, you kind of wonder, oh, can I do that? Is that even possible? So I think what you're doing is incredible and it's probably going to inspire a bunch of other maybe high school students, undergrad students that are watching you as well. And so I wanted to know um, while you were applying to dental school, and before that, how did you find 
other opportunities? I know that you were working with this dentist, but did you find other volunteer opportunities? How would you recommend other students doing so? Of course. Um, so while I was an undergrad, I initially was a biology major. And I think that that's what a lot of us automatically go into. We think, uh, all of the prerequisites are automatically built into these science majors. So maybe we should just major in one of these science majors. Right. <laughs> and I was two years in to the program of integrative biology at U of I and everything was going just fine. You know, I was passing all of my classes, I was doing well, but um, it wasn't until I was about to start my junior year and I had to take this ecology class and no offense to people that love ecology. I mean, <laughs> we need those people. We need them out there. But I was in like this lake and it was leech infested <laughs> and we were catching fish and then we were in a field catching mice. And that was like a couple weeks into the class where I was just like, wait, no, I don't need this. Why am I taking this class? Why am I in this major? So I ended up switching to um, community health, which is public health. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And in that program, there is an externship that is built into it in order for you to graduate. So the entire last semester of my senior year, I actually um, was externing at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District. Wow. So basically I was working full time. It was like 30, almost 40 hours a week. And um, I was working as a dental assistant um, at the public health center. So it was wonderful. I was working with kids, never thought I was going to go into Pico at that time. It's actually hilarious because I would tell, um, the doctors that I was working there, like, oh yeah, I want to specialize, but I could never do pedo. Oh my God, no, <laughs> but this is where, this is where we are now. Um, other than that, I also did a lot of different volunteering opportunities in um, undergrad. So I was a part of an organization called Healthy Smiles, where we would do various classroom visits to local Champaign-Urbana elementary schools and provide a lesson plan geared towards the child's age um, and their stage in development. And um, just went over oral hygiene instruction, uh, provided them with different oral hygiene materials that a lot of them didn't have. These were uh, children in more underserved areas. And um, I was also very active in my pre-dental club. Um, I was actually the president uh, for one year, my last year um, in the pre-dental club. And I was able to get a lot of um, philanthropy experience through there and also dental experience. I think definitely um, for those of you, because we're going to try to cover things for pre dens right now in the beginning, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty of pediatric specialty so that those of you that are interested kind of see how Dr. Vargas's process was. Uh, but for those of you that are pre-dental and you're seeking out those opportunities, whether it's volunteering or shadowing, if you can see whether your school has has opportunities like the ones that Dr. Vargas had, and if not, create your own, right? Um, if you can become an officer in your pre-dental club like she was and, you know, put together some of those opportunities, those school visits. Um, I know that Colgate definitely donates a lot of like toothpaste and toothbrushes uh, for, you know, organizations that need them that are going to do activities like this. So definitely reach out, try to do activities like those if that's what you're looking for. Anything I want to yeah. add to that? don't feel like you need to take on these huge roles like becoming the president or the vice president or organizing um, all of the philanthropy events or being the treasurer. You know, a lot of these positions do require a lot of work. However, you know, you are going to gain leadership experience even if you are a part of um, a community chair. Correct. So um, I believe it's called a community chair, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like they have the different groups where um, you can uh, work in groups of like four or five where you help each other to organize events as opposed to doing things on your own. Um, any way that you can get that leadership experience is going to be great, honestly. Yeah, and I 100% agree. Um, you And you wanted to see, uh, be something that's real to you also. I have friends that, you know, they love basketball and so they would volunteer their time, you know, 
teaching kids how to play basketball. So make sure it's something that you really, really like so that when you talk about it in your interview, it's something that comes across very natural, not like the stage, well, I want to talk to kids about oral health, you know? <laughs> and it should, it should be something that really comes from your heart because at the end of the day, that's kind of the profession that we're entering, you know, just serving people. So one last thing here for pre dents before we kind of move on. Uh, well, a couple last things. What's one piece of advice that you would give someone that's in the trenches of the application cycle? For the demo For application? Demo. Yes. I would really spend your time on your personal statement and be genuine. You know, grades matter. And I say this for the pediatric residencies as well. Grades matter. They definitely do. You want to do well in your classes. Um, however, they're not everything. And neither are these standardized tests. So you want to do well, but there are other ways to shine on top of that. And I think that your true personality really comes out in your personal statement. When I write mine, I like to tell a story. I like to tell multiple stories, actually, about different patient interactions or different interactions with people or different children, um, really just anyone. But I like to tell a story and be very descriptive. And I think that's something that keeps the admissions committee very intrigued and engaged. And it's also very memorable. So be yourself. Um, they're not looking for you know these cookie cutter responses or you saying that you want to go into dentistry because your mom's a dentist or your dad's a dentist or um, even if you were inspired by your dentist they want to know what's your reason why is this profession something that you are passionate about what what makes it spark for you and i think that's huge and another thing that i would um definitely make sure you spend some time on and make sure that you word it correctly is your personal, not your personal statements, your letters of recommendation. So letters of recommendation are also huge because if you think about it, these admissions committees for both um, dental school and any residency that you decide to apply to, they don't know you and they're looking at these applications like, okay, this person looks great on paper. They've got good grades. Um, they wrote a bomb personal statement, but what do other people think of them? Right. How do they portray themselves in a professional setting? And I think that is huge. So really make sure that you form strong relationships with even two or three faculty members in um, your undergraduate classes. And then this goes for um, those of you that are in dental school, really try to form those solid relationships with at least a couple of um, dentists, especially dentists that are in the field that you specifically want to go into and make sure that you always show up as your best self. You know, you leave your personal um, issues or whatever you have at home always, but when you go to work, you show up to work and you bring your best self to them. Um, and when you're asking for a letter of recommendation, always make sure you word it correctly. So when I always ask for mine, I ask, hi, Dr. So-and-so. Um, I like to, you know, sandwich everything that I say when I'm asking for something. So of course, you know, you can let them reflect a little bit on your experiences with them and then let them know how much of an honor it would be for them to write you a letter of recommendation because it really is an honor. That's not you being fake or anything, you're being genuine. This is somebody that you formed a relationship with and that um, you really know can speak to your character. And then after that, um, I would highly recommend you word it like this. Um, can you, would you be willing to write me a strong and positive letter of recommendation? Yes. You can't just say, can you write me a letter of recommendation because Honestly, anyone can write you one, even someone that really, really likes you. But maybe you never know what people are thinking or who may really not be for your um, development in the profession. And you know, it's it does it doesn't sound the best to say that, but it really is true. You never know. Um, but people can say, yeah, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. And it's actually quite terrible if they will be willing to write you a strong and positive letter of recommendation. 
And I think that really matters. And if you need to meet with them via Zoom or social distance over a cup of coffee or something, maybe have a phone conversation or you need to send them your resume or your CV, I would highly recommend that so that they can truly speak to your character. And if you have any um, anything that you want them to kind of emphasize in the letter, like let's say you have a lower GPA or you didn't do very well in one of your courses and you want them to say, hey, you know, this student um, persevered, they may not have had the best GPA or gotten the best score in my course. However, I can speak to their character and their work ethic. Um, so make sure that you're able to, you know, have those conversations and feel comfortable with them so that they can really vouch for you in a situation like that. I 100% agree with everything that you just said, and that applies to both pre dens and dental students applying to residency. I definitely think that you hit the nail on the head with that, that strong, positive letter of recommendation. Um, also, if you guys want to just spice things up for your, um, for anybody writing your letter of recommendation when you're requesting it, if you guys want to include like a link to pictures or a slideshow of your experiences, I think that's also really helpful because then they see that whatever you sent them in a resume is real, you know, and they're going to look at it and say, wow, this person really knows what they're doing and they actually really are passionate about this. And so I think that's also really helpful too, like a little lookbook. That's kind of what I did when I was applying. Incredible, also, by the way. I never thought of a lookbook. Oh, it, it is such a cool really? idea, I think, because, you know, a lot of students come in and they talk about, oh, this is what I've done. I've done, I've done, and I've done this and that. And I think when I would walk in with that little book with a bunch of pictures of my experiences volunteering and things like that, I think it becomes more real. So if you guys are into that, go ahead and do that. I know CVS has really great deals on little photo books. <laughs> So you can go ahead and do something like that. Um, but Jess, okay, so we went from, I'm not sure I can work with kids to, I think I can work with kids too. I really wanna work with kids. So when did you think during your dental school experience, wow, this is for me, I can see myself being a pediatric dentist. Yeah, so anyone that knows me from dental school and even from undergrad knows that I was a die hard Perio fan. <laughs> I love Perio to this day. I love it. I thought I was going to go into Perio residency. Um, I really love surgery. I enjoy taking out teeth. I like, um, you know, laying all the cool flaps. Like I just really enjoyed Perio. I used to go to like the American Academy of Perio meetings. I would listen in on the CE. I was really involved with the perio department um, at Marquette. And the switch for me um, was D3 year. I, after taking the pediatric course D2 year, right. I started to really like it. And I was like, wait, hold up. <laughs> this is really intriguing. And um, I really liked the idea that with pediatrics, you can also help special needs patients. And that is something that is very near and dear to my heart because, you know, these children and even adults, you know, that are special needs, they deserve the utmost quality of care, just like any other patient does. However, um, just because they are not able to be seen in a traditional dental setting or they may require a practitioner that is a little bit more um, uh, seasoned with their expertise or they've done a residency in order to be able to treat these patients effectively. Um, you know, a lot of practitioners, they just kind of steer away from treating special needs patients because they think it's too difficult or they think it's not worth the hassle. And I don't consider it a hassle at all. Um, and that is a niche that I knew that I wanted to be able to fill. Um, I consider myself a very empathetic individual. So um, that was just something very near and dear to my heart. I knew I wanted to work with special needs. Um, and so after that second, uh, that D2 year, also in the labs, a lot of the pediatric dentists were like, oh, you know, nice preps. You should go into, you know, these are <laughs> <funny> preps. <laughs> so, you know, I was 
considering it. But then D3 year, um, I went to a meeting, a perio meeting, and it was about peri-implantitis and everyone was freaking out in the room. It was very um, daunting. I haven't experienced like a day where I was just like, oh my gosh, this is a little bit too much. This is overwhelming. <laughs> no one's happy in this room right now. People are like sweating profusely. What's going on? <laughs> we can't fix peri-implantitis. What are we gonna do? There's too many implants being placed. Oh my gosh, people are losing bone. So then a little bit after that, I got to do an OR case, a pediatric OR case with uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Hodgson, who is a phenomenal pediatric dentist at Marquette. Okay. And um, he was one of the dentists that inspired me as well. So shout out to Dr. Hodgson, Dr. <laughs> Angelis, uh, and also Dr. DeRose. They were all um, excellent. So I did a pediatric um, OR case, which was phenomenal just to have that experience as a D3. And um, just going up to Children's Hospital of Wisconsin with Dr. Hodgson and having um, him mentor me the entire way with one of my classmates um, and really understanding the important role that we were playing in a child's life. The child was about five years old and um, unfortunately, you know, his entire dentition needed to be restored and he wasn't um, able to be seen in a traditional dental setting due to various reasons. And just knowing that I was able to change this child's life and his overall health for the future, I really, you know, we set him up for success. And understanding that only a pediatric dentist is able to do what I was doing. Right. And it just, it was mind blowing. I absolutely loved it. I wanted to do it again and again and again. I wanted to learn more. Um, Pediatrics, it's just, <laughs> I love it. It's just absolutely amazing. Like all of the different opportunities that we have to treat, like I said, special needs patients, children that have um, uh, behavioral issues or um, very complex craniofacial abnormalities or um, just, you know, an array of different medical problems. It is absolutely amazing to treat these children and also treating the healthy kids as well um, and keeping them healthy, uh, but also setting the children up that uh, may not have had the best start to their um, dental health for whatever reason and being able to be that individual to intervene, help them establish a dental home, bring them to health, and then just set them up for a future life of good health and yeah. success. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You can honestly see your enthusiasm come through <laughs> and you might've been very sweet on. before, but I can definitely see that love for uh, peds. So that's really, really awesome. And I wanted to know, what does your day-to-day -day look like in pediatric residency? All programs are going to be different. When you're looking into pediatric residency, it's important to think what you want out of a program. So there's hospital-based programs. There are combined programs, which I would consider UCLA a combined program where it's hospital and academic. And then there are programs that are very academic. So um, my program being a combined program, I would say it is pretty heavy uh, didactics though. We take a lot of classes. So that first month of residency, we basically had like a boot camp of classes that we were taking at the, well, everything was on Zoom, but normally it would be, you know, in a classroom or an auditorium setting. So I've heard with a lot of the medical residents and um, the other dental residents in other specialties um, so we took a lot of courses and then also we were taking introduction to pediatric dentistry courses. Um, something very unique to UCLA is we also learn a lot of comprehensive orthodontics and we have a lot of dual trained pediatric orthodontics um, specialists. So it's absolutely amazing. It's a lot of work because you're like, okay, wait, I'm in a pediatric residency right now. However, 
I'm also learning how to do history and physicals. And then you also want me to learn orthodontics. So it's a little <laughs> overwhelming at times, of course, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and not all programs are like that, but yeah. So we took a lot of classes and then we started clinic, um, I would say mid August ish. And um, that was wonderful. Uh, we just had recalls at first and then the restorative eventually picked up, which was wonderful. <laughs> um, and I honestly appreciated just doing recalls at first because it kind of gives you an opportunity to get your feet wet, to really understand the growth and development of a child because as a pediatric dental specialist, you are in charge of knowing the growth and development of an infant to whatever age that you decide to practice on. So you also have to understand when to intervene orthodontically and whatnot. So um, knowing the eruption sequences, counting the teeth. I know it was difficult for me at first, like, okay, wait, I'm used to only doing like 1, 16, 17, 32. Now you want me to do the mixed dentition <laughs> analysis. <laughs> yeah, you do that, but um, now it clicks where it's like, okay, I can look at the tooth and I'm like, oh, that's B. That, okay. <laughs> but at first I was singing the ABCs in my head. Um, so yeah, now I guess I can give you guys what a regular week looks like. So Monday morning, usually in clinic from um, 8 a.m. to around 12. And then in the afternoon, uh, we have a literature review, which again is unique to my program. Not all programs are gonna have that, but if you're going to um, an academic or a combined program that is um, that has a heavy emphasis on the academic portion, then you will have literature reviews more than likely, which is excellent because it sets you up to uh, pass your pediatric, de pediatric dental boards and then eventually your oral boards a year after you graduate. Um, so we have a literature review with the second year residents. Tuesdays, um, we have clinic in the morning uh, and in the afternoon is our ortho clinic. So we see all of our ortho patients um, that day or that afternoon, which is excellent. I wish we had more time with ortho because right. you know I'm, I'm realizing it's really just this huge puzzle and there's so many different ways to correct a malocclusion and there's so many different ways to intervene with interceptive orthodontics and um, you really can read about these things and see it on a lecture and be lectured about it, but you don't really know until you're actually doing the ortho, doing the dentistry part. Right. So I love the ortho clinic. I have a blast in it. I'm really taking a big liking to it. Um, and then Wednesday, we have our IV general anesthesia clinic. So again, this is something that is unique to UCLA. Um, not a lot of programs offer this, but I think it's absolutely amazing. So there's different ways to treat children uh, based on their behavior and their stage in growth and development, and also the extent of the treatment that is needed. So for children that may need full mouth dental rehabilitation and they're very little, um, so we're saying like maybe two and a half to really any age, um, we can sedate them in off, or not sedate them, but we can put them under general anesthesia in the office um, and we will have a dental anesthesiologist that comes in and the first years work directly with the dental anesthesiologist. So again, this is something that is unique to the program at UCLA. Uh, we become very well-rounded with anesthesia. You kind of feel like a mini dental anesthesiologist. Um, you learn how to maintain an airway very, very well. Um, and, uh, you know, we're working with the dental anesthesiologist, like I said, very closely. Um, we're the ones listening in with the pretracheal stethoscope. So we are in charge of making sure that that child is breathing. So it's very no intense. <laughs> it's nerve wracking, no pressure, not at all. Is he breathing? Yes, yes, he's breathing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the child's hooked up to a uh, pulse oximeter and, you know, the EKG, um, sometimes temperature, depending on, you know, what, uh, how the child's being put under general anesthesia, gas versus, um, like, uh, propofol or IV. But anyway, so 
um, that's where we have our IV general anesthesia days. And then the second year resident is the one doing all of the dentistry. So they're doing usually a full mouth dental rehabilitation case. So those cases are usually, you know, all morning. Um, it's a great experience. I can't wait to be a second year so I can be the one doing the dish. <laughs> but it's absolutely, absolutely awesome to get that experience doing the anesthesia and yeah. really working with the dental anesthesiologist. Um, so then Wednesday afternoons, we usually have off because the morning is pretty draining. That's a draining <laughs> day. So Wednesday afternoon, we'll have maybe a lecture um, sometimes you'll have to do uh, pre-doc clinic. So, or not pre-doc clinic. Um, I'm talking as a first year. I'm not really sure how the second year goes yet, but um, as a first year, sometimes we teach on, we get experience teaching. So we have virtual clinic days with the pre-doc students and we go through different modules with them. So treatment planning, orthodontics module, um, caries risk assessment modules, um, radiographic interpretation modules, really just everything. So you get some great teaching experience as well. Um, and maybe you will have an in-person uh, pre-doc that comes in and you'll be able to assess them and kind of teach them um, how to deal with pediatric patients um, and whatnot. Things are a little bit different with COVID, uh, but nonetheless, we're still getting that great experience. Something I didn't mention, on Tuesdays in the morning or all day, actually, you may have OR day. So in the OR, that's where we take our um, very medically complex patients and medically compromised patients to the operating room at Ronald Reagan Hospital. And um, usually there's two cases in the day and you work with either a second year resident or now we're gonna start working with the first year residents together in pairs since we've all had our first cases. Um, I had my first case a couple of weeks ago, which was <laughs> it was my favorite day of residency so far. Um, so thank you. Uh, so now moving on to Thursday, Thursday, it's usually just clinic all day. Okay. Which is awesome. You'll see maybe eight to 10 patients. And then Friday we have clinic in the morning and then in the afternoon we have lecture. Now UCLA loves lectures. They love didactics. <laughs> so you can expect a lecture possibly before clinic at like 7 a.m. You can expect one probably at like 6 p.m. You can expect one maybe during your lunch, wherever they can fit a lecture in, they will. But I appreciate it um, because, you know, knowledge is really power. Sometimes you don't want to go to class and you're like, oh my gosh, again. Been there. But yes, we've all been there, but um, it's truly worth it. And if class time, in lectures is not really your thing. And you're just like, no, that's not what I wanna do. I don't really wanna you know, study anymore. Well, you're gonna have to study either way, but let's say you just don't wanna take classes anymore. Um, and that's not really your goal as a pediatric dentist, then hospital programs are amazing too. And you won't have classes. So it's really what you want out of your program. And uh, me personally, I thought, well, you know what? I really, 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 really want to be the pediatric dental specialist that um, someone asked me a question about a very medically complex case or a very advanced case, and I know the answer. Right. Why? Because I had the classes. So, <laughs> um, whereas, you know, you're still going to get excellent experience. You're going to be an excellent pediatric dentist no matter which program you go to. Um, but I really value that. Uh, didactic portion a lot and I think it's it's definitely valuable for the future for boards um, for your knowledge as a clinician um, and just all of it yeah I think that's awesome I'm actually learning a lot I didn't know that there was a program you know that would just be maybe just hospital based or combined so I think that that's that's really interesting. I, I find that actually pretty helpful for anyone that might have that dilemma where they're just not sure if they want to continue schooling or they're a little bit burnt out and maybe they should consider what kind of program they want to kind of um, apply to. So when you, you 
did all of undergrad, you did dental school, now you're in pediatric residency. All of that takes an adjustment and all of that has a learning curve. So I'm just wondering, what do you think the most difficult thing transition, basically the, what was the most difficult thing that you found when you were transitioning from pre-doc, you know, dental school to pediatric residency? Um, I think the most difficult, well, there were two. One being so far away from my family. Right. So I ranked, I, I interviewed at a couple programs and I ranked UCLA number one, despite the distance, because I knew it was a phenomenal program. I knew that I was going to get both the clinical and the didactic experience that I needed. I knew that I wanted to experience a different training style other than the Midwest. I thought it would be great to combine, you know, because I was told from other pediatric dentists, including some of my mentors, that dentists that are trained in, on the East Coast versus the South versus the Midwest or the West Coast, they all practice differently because they're simply taught differently. We all have the same end result, but there's different ways of doing things in dentistry. And I think that's part of the beauty of it. But anyway, I knew I wanted to spread my wings and you know, go to the West Coast. So I, like I said, I ranked them number one, um, but it is difficult um, being in a pandemic and being so far away from my family. Yes. So I got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> His it. name is Onyx. Um, I got a cat when I moved here less than a month after being here, just because, you know, I wanted um, I needed that unconditional love and support from an animal. <laughs> so I got my pet, um, absolutely love him. Shout out to Gorgeous. Onyx. Gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> over your cat. So the distance definitely. And then um, another difficult transition was, um, I guess, going back into that mindset of being a student. Mm -hmm. and having to take exams again and having to study again, because that's another thing. At UCLA, you're gonna get exams. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be tested on material. They wanna know, do you really know? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Especially during a pandemic where things are online for classwork. And you know, I appreciate that because let's be honest, nobody wants to take exams, but if you don't have an exam for a class, you're not gonna go as hard as you do for a class that has an exam because you wanna do well on that exam to show that you know your stuff. So um, that was another you know, difficult transition because the last like year, almost year and a half of dental school, you don't take that many classes. No. <laughs> um, you take classes, but it's nowhere near, you know, like the rigor of classes that first and second year are. So definitely that as well. Yeah, I can definitely attest to that. I am in my last semester of didactic classes, which I can't even believe, but I know all of <laughs> our, <laughs> my classmates, including myself, we're definitely feeling like this last semester is just getting a little bit harder to, you know, keep that grind going when it comes to didactics. Even those of us who were didactically strong from the beginning, we're definitely finding it a little bit like, okay, we're almost there, almost there. Definitely. Uh, I think a lot of the things that you touched on are so, so important, uh, Dr. Vargas, because I think um, I'm an out-of-state dental student as well, and it's just really hard things to consider, you know, when you're applying for that next step, next uh, residency, uh, just being far away from home, finding your support system, those are all important things. We definitely put our education first before anything. Um, a lot of us can attest to that, but just keep in mind how you're going to make that transition and just ask a lot of questions, right? So um, maybe Jess is giving you guys a better idea as to based on her day-to-day -day and her program, just some of the questions that you should be asking when you're considering residency. Uh, just how many days of classes do you have? And do you have any, you know, how often are you in the OR? Do you get an anesthesia experience? Who do you work closely with? What can you do as a first year versus a second year? 
all of those mm -hmm. things. Um, Jess, do you know if UCLA does uh, externships or are they doing things virtually now for people that are trying to apply? Do you know if it's you know okay for them to kind of reach out if they want to? Yeah, so I would definitely reach out to the program director. Um, if you're interested in the program, feel free to reach out to the director of diversity as well. Um, if you're interested in the program, highly, I would highly recommend that. Just let them know, hey, you know, my name is so-and-so. I uh, really would love to uh, learn more about your program. Make sure you take a look at the website first and um, yeah. <laughs> really do your own research prior because it doesn't matter which program you're going to or which uh, faculty in a program that you're speaking to. I think one of their biggest pet peeves is when you ask a question that's on their website. <laughs> that is answered on their website. So make sure you do, you know, do your own research beforehand, but definitely reach out. Um, and as far as externships, I know that when I was applying, so pre-COVID, they did offer an externship. I personally didn't go on any externships that were not within driving distance from me just because it was very expensive. And I personally just didn't have the funds to travel for externships and then also travel for potential interviews. So um, now during you know the pandemic, I do know that they had a virtual externship for the previous year applicants. So I'm pretty sure if they don't allow you to come in person, there will be some type of virtual externship where it would be great for them to see your face, put a face to a name, and um, you'd be able to speak to the program director, I'm sure, and uh, get some more insight to the program. Awesome. Yes, those are all good things that we want to hear because the more you guys are able to kind of start showing your interest, that's really important. And once you apply, they'll be like, oh, we remember her or him. Um, so I wanted to ask you, based on your application, I mean, we've seen that you've done incredible things, but is there anything that you did differently during dental school that you feel made you stand out as an applicant? Definitely. Um, so something that I personally did, I was very involved with research. And I'm not saying that you have to get involved with research if you want to specialize, because you definitely don't. But I did a lot of research. So from D1 year, I knew I wanted to specialize. I just didn't know, um, you know, my route to specialty. I didn't know how I was going to go about it because, again, I was a first generation college student. Me getting into dental school was like, oh my gosh, am I really <laughs> supposed to be here? We all suffer from that imposter syndrome, oh, especially yeah. as first gen. So I, I was like, okay, I should get into research. So um, I would highly recommend any of you, if you know, you're still fairly early in the game, just dip your feet into some research if you can. Uh, you don't have to spend tons and tons of hours in the lab, even if you just want to go in and shadow for a, an hour or two a week um, during your free time, which I know we <laughs> don't have much free time, but um, it really does make a difference to just have that research experience. And um, I think that was something that definitely set me apart because um, I remember when I was interviewing at different programs, um, they were always very impressed with the fact that I did so much research. Um, so, like I said, research is something that set me apart. And I would also say my uh, experience with leadership. So I was a part of SNDA and also um, HSDA, which Josie did phenomenal things with. Oh my <laughs> goodness, you are amazing. Um, and then I was also involved with um, just other, you know, philanthropy projects at the dental school, which were able to show my interest in community service and my interest in children, like give kids a smile and whatnot. Um, and also I volunteered in the pediatric clinic whenever I could. So if I made sure to get a lot of my requirements done, 
really early so that I had more time to be in the pedo clinic. And then I went to the pediatric coordinator and I was like, hey, I am pretty much done with my requirements. So if you need someone to see patients, I'm here. (laughs) And um, that was great because, you know, I got the extra pedo experience um, and it really uh, showed my interest and I was able to write that on my application or my CV. Say leadership experiences, community service, research, and um, yeah, just being able to show your genuine passion I about the profession. Incredible, and we can obviously see your passion coming through, and the fact that you got to finish your requirements early. Anybody that's in dental school knows that's that's another hustle for sure. Um, but I wanted to kind of close this out before we maybe open it in case others have questions and we kind of let you go because we know you're super busy and it is late. Um, but I wanted to touch a little bit on, I know that we have a lot of people on here that are you know, minorities and uh, part of my platform a lot of times is also touching upon that because I do get a lot of message from messages from other minorities that constantly ask, you know, how you feel in your environment or your experience. So I wanted to know, um, what advice would you have for minorities entering dental school? Because while we're still, we're trying to make everything uh, more equal, we're trying to actually, you know, make strides in this area and just have a little bit more representation, but things are still not perfect. I mean, we all know that we are all in different dental schools and we experience different things. So I just wanted to know if there's some advice that you can give other minorities that are going into dental school or going into specialties, you know, there's not a ton of us per class. So what, what can you tell us based on your experience? Definitely. I think that's a great way to end everything (laughs) before we jump into questions. So, you know, as a uh, multiracial woman, as a Black woman, I feel like I definitely, and a lot of us can agree that you experience a different journey on your path to dental school and then your path in dental school and then afterwards. Um, Dentistry, trying to figure out how to word this. (laughs) Dentistry Dentistry is a profession that is dominated by people that simply do not look like us. Mm -hmm. You know, less than 5% of dentists are black. And I wanna say less than six percent are Hispanic and then even less the number goes even smaller when you're talking about specialists yep then you're in less than the one (laughs) percent of you know specialists that are um, people of color Mm -hmm. so black women or you know Latina women so no matter what dental school you go to you're always going to And this goes for even those of you that are in undergrad. You're going to experience microaggressions. That's just the world that we live in. And that took a lot for me to accept that I was always going to experience these microaggressions. And um, especially in dental school, you know, you never want to say too much. You kind of just let things roll off of your shoulders because you're like, I'm here. (laughs) Thank God I'm here. I just want to get out. Please. I got my DDS or my CMD. Um, but, you know, I can admit there were things that were said to me that were just not okay. Um, whether that was, was from, you know, other dental students that were in my program or unfortunately from faculty. Uh, and that is a story that is well known for a lot of us, probably all of us, you know. And um, I would say to always keep your head up and be graceful. Because when somebody is saying something to you that you recognize is inappropriate, they are um, being racist in some way, they are trying to attack you 
with some type of microaggression. They know they're being nasty to you. They know it. And what they're trying to do is get a rise out of you. And um, this is something that I like to think about in regards to all different aspects of life. You know, anything that somebody does to you or says to you that is inappropriate or is physically meant to kind of harm your spirit, um, it's just a reflection of who they are and it has absolutely nothing to do with you. So when any of these situations would present themselves to me, I handled them with grace. Yes. I am not the type of person that sits there and argues. I'm not gonna go back and forth with you. I'm not gonna try to prove myself. I'm just gonna let my credentials and what I do speak for myself. Absolutely. And um, <laughs> always, <laughs> exactly. And you've got to keep, keep going forward and don't give those people the time of day. Your patients are going to love you. Oh, yes. Because there's something special about us. We've got, we've got a way that we interact with our patients that is special. And we're able to empathize with them in a very special way. And we uh, care for our patients a little bit differently and um, we're able to translate things a little bit differently for them and I think that that goes a long way and it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks this is about you this is about dentistry this is about breaking shattering glass ceilings this is about your patients this is about your future very well said. I think that, you know, this is an issue that we see everywhere, workplaces, schools, everywhere. So um, just, you know, whether you, whether you believe it or not, you have allies. I mean, I have friends from all sorts of walks of life, you know, white, Asian, Middle Eastern, whatever you call it, you know, you have your allies. Um, lean on those people when you feel like something is, you're, you're not really sure. Sometimes it's like this tiny little, huh, was that really, wait, <laughs> you know? And, and, and like Dr. Vargas said, you handle it with as much grace as possible because um, you are meant to be there. And that little imposter syndrome we all get from time to time, kind of shoo it away in that moment and just, you know, stand your ground and be very respectful about it all. Um, I know that our friends at Iowa Dental School are experiencing, you know, enough of their own issues. So I appreciate you sharing, you know, your story and we're seeing you here in all of your glory, no matter what. Uh, <laughs> and so we're excited to see you Definitely. graduate pediatric residency, but thank you so much for coming on here. I'm so excited that we did this. Thank you. And Me if you too. guys, this was amazing. <laughs> if you guys want to send some questions <laughs> into the chat, because I know that um, I wanted to open this up while we were recording. Uh, and I think we have a little bit of questions here. Um, so let's see. I think you answered that question about research. Is Teresa, is this a D, is this a dental student? Oh, she's applying okay. this cycle. Okay, okay. So oh, you're to dental school. Wonderful. Be dental so student. something I would say then, um, something I would say then is what I did, it was like the first week or two of dental school where, um, you know, a lot of people are just focused on classes and whatnot. I went to the research lab <laughs> and I spoke to the head of the research lab, Dr. Taibi, and I let her know that I was very eager and interested in research and wanted to, um, you know, get my feet wet. And um, I think being one of those initial people that go and speak to the head of the research lab is very important because you know, I think they kind of have limited spots and it's really just volunteer. They're not looking at your grades and saying, oh, well, this person did better in this class than you. So um, we're going to take them instead. Like, it's not like that. It's more so on a, I would say kind of like a first come first serve basis, especially if you have a specific area of research that you want to go into. Um, and honestly, like I said, even if you're just shadowing for your first semester or your first year, because it's a lot um, already with your classes and stuff. You don't have to be, 
you know, super deep into research, just go in and shadow a couple times a month. Um, show that you're interested and then as the years progress and your workload didactically gets a little bit um, smaller, then you're able to put more effort into your research. And another thing was I was able to go um, three years to the IADR meeting, so the International Association for Dental Research. Um, so Marquette specifically funds students, dental students, to go on these trips and present posters. And it's an excellent experience. Um, and also it's, it's great to go and yeah. travel. The best one was in Vancouver. Like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm in Vancouver. Um, and, you know, you get to experience the area that you're in, but also, um, you know, learn more about research and really see what others in the dental profession are working on. And it's really an eye-opening experience. So I would definitely recommend speaking um, to them early and good luck applying. You're going to get in, reach out if you have questions. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I definitely think that what you said is such a good idea. I think a lot of people feel like if they're on the fence about research that they have to go in right away, guns blazing and, you know, maybe going in and shadowing first and showing that you're interested, but not necessarily committing that amount of time. I think that's a really great idea. And then for those of you that are pre-dense, um, if you are into research, uh, definitely go for it. If you are not into research, don't lie and say that you are so excited about research in your interviews because schools will definitely, I think I had a friend who they literally asked him, so, oh, do you, do you enjoy research? And they said, yes, I absolutely love it. And they're like, well, this is not the school for you because we don't do a lot of research. So <laughs> make sure you <laughs> document yourself on what schools are about and what they're able to offer you before you say anything or just you know assume that they want you to be excited about it. Um, but I feel like uh, Dr. Vargas, we answered so many questions. Um, yeah, there's I, just one more question here I wanted to answer. Yeah, go ahead. Um, from Taylor Jackson. So how did you handle the transition from dental school to residency since the workload is significantly heavier? Um, so Taylor, I wouldn't necessarily say the workload is significantly heavier. It's just a different type of stress and a different type of workload. Plus me right now, my experience is a little bit different because I'm also getting my MPH. So I decided to, at the same time during my residency, get my master's in public health. Um, so I have, you know, all of those classes um, that I'm dealing with on top of the residency. <laughs> um, however, when it comes to uh, the workload of residency, um, honestly, you're, especially at UCLA, you're gonna feel like a D1, D2 again nonstop. Um, <laughs> but if you got through dental school, you're going to make it through residency. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. You're going to do awesome. I see you with your deniform posing, like the passion <laughs> is there. You're going to do wonderful. Um, and you also have to remember you are starting the program with your co-residents and your co-residents are all in the same position that you are in. So you always have someone to lean on. And then you have residents that are second years. And if your program's three years, well, you even have third year residents that can help you. Plus you've got faculty. Uh, residency is truly like a family at UCLA, which is why I chose the program because I also wanted to make sure that I was gonna be in a positive and healthy environment for myself. And that's what I've experienced at my program. And I couldn't be happier with how healthy the environment is and how much it breeds diversity. Um, and it truly is a wonderful program. Uh, and I'm just, I feel blessed to be in the environment that I'm in, surrounded by the individuals that I'm in. Um, and don't get me wrong, I absolutely love, love, love my, uh, the faculty and mentors and my, uh, forever friends that I also met during dental school. Um, not everything was, um, <laughs> not everything was uh, about microaggressions in dental school. I met 
wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people and forever friends, like I said, and colleagues and wonderful faculty at Marquette and um, wonderful mentors. Uh, like I said, one of them's in here right now, Dr. Ireland. She's absolutely phenomenal. She's becoming an endodontist now. So yeah. you just make such excellent connections along the way. You make excellent connections along the way. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't worry. You have your tribe, you have your people and um, you'll make it through. When you get accepted into a residency program, they're not trying to make sure you fail. They're trying to make sure you get through it. <laughs> <laughs> Plus they're paying you, they're paying you. So it's like, you're getting paid to do this. Um, it's not like dental school where, oh, you can pay all this money and then you fail a class, we kick you out, bye-bye. <laughs> so it's different, it's different. You're really a family. That must that must be so nice. And I will definitely say um, our experience at Marquette, you know, I, I truly do appreciate how clinical it has been. And would you say that you've been pretty prepared? I would say that Marquette prepared me in ways that I am so blessed <laughs> didactically and clinically I feel 100% prepared and I think when you graduate from Marquette you can go straight out into practice and you will be 100% fine they just offer so much clinical ex experience and um, you know every dental school is different but I can really say that Marquette has a very, very, very strong clinical program and it will prepare you to go straight into practice and to excel in any residency that you decide. That was, that was for me, guys. That was my own <laughs> uh, wanting to know, you know. <laughs> that was for you, Joe. That was for me. No, that program. <laughs> no, we, we work. It, it's tough, but it's yeah, it's true. We work really hard. They work us really hard and we get in there really, really early. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to hear that it does pay off. And that's always exciting. You know, when you're in the trenches, everything seems like it's a lot. But if the end result is worth it, we're going to keep, you know, <laughs> killing it. Um, so I think, yeah, we did a great job of kind of answering a lot of questions. Thank you so much for donating your time. This is the very yeah. first dental bio series, you know, interview. And I'm really, really glad that we did this. I was so excited for this. So much better than the Super Bowl. <laughs> right? What is the Super Bowl? Is there cereal there? <laughs> So I really appreciate you guys that wanted to tune into the live recording for coming in and getting your questions answered. Um, thank you, Dr. Vargas. Thank you for everyone that came out and I will let you have an amazing night. I'm going to head out myself. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Sounds Dr. great. Thank you, Josie, again. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to see how many people showed up on uh, Super Bowl day. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I hope I was able to uh, provide some knowledge and pearls that can help you along your journey throughout um, dental school and the application process through uh, to pediatric residency. And if you ever have any questions, uh, Josie is an excellent 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 resource this girl is absolutely killing it um and you can also feel free to reach reach out to me um give us I'm your on instagram. instagram handle so we can follow you yeah so instagram it's just my name at uh dr jessica vargas um i'm gonna start posting some cool tiktok soon at dr jessica vargas and um yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us tonight. And I wish and pray for your future success. Um, and I know that you will all make excellent contributions to the field of dentistry and uh, pediatric dentistry and beyond. Thank you so much, Dr. Vargas. Thank you for inspiring us tonight. So everybody go out, 
tomorrow. It's Monday. <laughs> it's always a hard day. I hope you are motivated, excited, and just know that you can absolutely do whatever it is that you have planned for yourself. So with that, thank you guys so much for tuning in to Deco Dental's first dental bio series interview. Thank you, Dr. Fergus. Have an amazing night. Thank you, Josie. This was wonderful. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.